Hey guys, today we're going to talk about properties of rational functions. So the reason why rational functions make sense to follow our polynomial functions that we've been talking about is because rational functions are simply just one polynomial over another. Yes, 5 is a polynomial, it's a monomial. x minus 7, also a polynomial, it's a binomial. So now we're going to talk about, okay, what if we have a polynomial over a polynomial and the properties that we're after we want to find out, okay, well, if we have one of these guys, and it's kind of similar to what we did with polynomials, we want the x-intercepts, we want the y-intercepts, we're going to introduce horizontal asymptotes, um, domain range, pretty standard stuff again, and then we're also going to introduce vertical asymptotes. In other words, where does this graph get really, really close to but not touch horizontally? Where does it get really, really close to but not touch vertically? So the first example we're going to use is 5 over x minus 7. So that creates this graph here in red. And remember, we have access to our graphing calculators, okay? So we can use these at any time. But visually inspecting, okay? What is my x-intercept? Well, my x-intercept happens whenever my graph crosses my y, or my x-axis, excuse me. And it doesn't really look like this is gonna happen. So potentially this thing doesn't exist. We'll dig in algebraically and see. Um, y-intercept, where does this thing cross? We can like, oh, very clearly see, oh, it's, right here at this point, but what exactly is that point? Well, we'll figure that out algebraically. Horizontal asymptotes is just kind of, you can think about it as where is the break in this graph horizontally? If I were to draw a line like where these things break horizontally, where is that at? Um, vertical asymptotes, same thing. If I were to draw a line where these things kind of break vertically, so that would be here. So that's just, I'm just giving you guys the definitions and seeing what they look like graphically right now. Domain is still, okay, well, over my whole x-axis, what is kind of covered? Well, it looks like everything to negative infinity is covered. It looks like we're covered up until this point here where we have kind of a break, and then we start again. And we'll see that this point is exactly the restricted pieces of our domain. We'll also find algebraically the range how far down to how far up it goes. It looks like, well, it goes all the way down to negative infinity, it goes all the way up to positive infinity. But again, there's this break in here. And how do we figure out exactly where that break is? Um, and that's it. All right, so how to find all this stuff algebraically. So if we have the graph, you can always do this by visual inspection. Now that you know what the pieces are and what you're looking for, you can graph it and go visual inspection and say, okay, well, here's all my points, okay? But what if you don't have the graph or like we can't really tell what this point is right here and I can't really make it out. How can I use algebra to assist me? So let's start. So how to find x-intercepts? Well, x-intercepts, we want to know where the function is equal to 0. Okay, this is also um, the same as set your numerator equal to zero, because if we can find where the numerator is equal to zero, we can find where the whole thing is equal to zero. So for x-intercept, set numerator equal to zero. So in our case, we're going to set 5 equal to zero. And does this ever happen? No, 5 is never equal to zero. So what that means is that we don't have an x-intercept, which graphically we kind of thought the same thing too. We're like, this thing never even looks like it hits, and it doesn't. So our x-intercept, for us, we would say ours, d and e, ours does not exist, all right? So x-intercept, set your numerator, set your numerator equal to zero and solve. In this case, we got a d and e. Okay, what about y-intercept? Well, y-intercept, it's the same thing. How to find a y-intercept of any function anywhere? Plug in zero for x and see where it goes. So plug x equals 0 into the function. So if we do that, we would get 5 over 0 minus 7, which equals negative 5 sevenths. Oh, so that's what that number is down here. That's negative 5 sevenths. So the y-intercept here, so if y is equal to negative 5 sevenths, so x is 0, y is negative 5 sevenths. Okay, we got our y-intercept. So x-intercepts and y-intercepts, the same thing that we've always done. Where's the function equal to 0? Figure that out. What happens when we plug x equals 0 in? Figure that out. Intercepts are always the same, and they're never going to change. Horizontal asymptotes. So this one is kind of interesting. Let me erase this. 
So the process for finding horizontal asymptotes, what you do is you take your leading variables, if there is one, in this case we're going to see that there's not, and you kind of compare them. So in this case, we're going to compare our leading term for our numerator, just the 5. The leading term for the denominator is the x. And we're going to look at this. And basically, the, the overall process is as x goes to infinity, what happens to this? So as x gets really, really large, the numerator is always going to stay 5. So as x becomes 100, 1,000, 10,000, a million, 10 million, a billion, where does this function go? So as x gets really, really large, this function is going to go to zero, right? The bigger, the bigger, the bigger the denominator, the smaller, the smaller, the smaller, the smaller, the smaller, the smaller the function gets. So this guy is going to go to zero, and that's what we try to figure out for horizontal asymptotes. As you let your x's get very, 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 very big, what's going to happen? In this case, our function is going to go to zero. Horizontal asymptotes are expressed as y equals. So for us, it's y equals zero. In general, though, and here's kind of like a little algorithmic way you can figure it out. If you look at your leading, your leading terms in your numerator and your denominator, if you have x small over x big or constant, that implies, so if your denominator exponent is bigger than your numerator, then your asymptote will be at y equals 0, because the whole thing is going to go to 0. The denominator is going to outgrow the numerator, and it's going to shrink. Okay, the opposite thing is also, um, you can see, so if we have y big on top, sorry, not y, x, x big on top and x small, and I'm talking about the exponents, in other words, the exponent of the numerator is bigger than the exponent of the denominator, then we're going to get a DNE, because if that guy is bigger than that guy, that's going to grow faster than that. This thing is going to blow up, and it's never going to stop. So it's going to go to infinity. Basically, we're going to have an asymptote at infinity, but infinity is not actually a place. So here would be a D and E thing. Um, and then the other thing is, well, what if the powers are exactly the same? Like, in other words, what if I have an x squared over an x, I don't know, a 2x squared? Well, what do I do? Because those are the same. I don't have a bigger one or a smaller one. They're the same. Well, at that point, you look at the coefficients, and then that's where your asymptote is going to occur. So for instance, if you have a number in front of x and the same, same, not S-M-A-S-A-M, -S -S same, and same exponent over like a bx, and it's the same exponent, so whether it's a square, whether it's a cube, whether it's a one, whatever, your asymptote is going to be at y equals a over b. Just like here, the asymptote would be at 1 half, where the exponents are the same. So in general, that's how it works. So but our asymptote, the way we had, we had a small guy over a big guy because we just had a constant term, so we didn't have a next term. So this x is going to grow without bound, and we'll go to 0. OK, domain. We look at how far left this guy goes, how far right it goes, and is there any breaks in the middle? In this case, we can see there's going to be a break. But how to find domain algebraically is find out where the denominator is equal to 0 and exclude those values. So set denominator, denominator equal to 0. Find those x values, exclude those x values. So we can be everywhere except for those places. So in our case, if we set our denominator equal to 0, so it's x minus 7, equal to 0, add 7 on both sides. So when x equals 7, that's our excluded value. So when x equals 7, which is in fact around right here, if that's 10, x equals 7, we can be everything except for 7. As we start to get to 7, we kind of dive away from it in both directions. We don't want 7. So set denominator, we'll solve that. And that's the, the, the number that we're going to exclude. There may be multiple numbers also. In this case, there's just one. So we're going to exclude that. So our domain, then we go everywhere from negative infinity up until that value. We don't actually get there. And then we union with really, really close to that value again up until positive infinity. And you can see this from the graph. We re get really close there, but then we dive away. Even from the other direction, we get really, really close there, and then we dive away. So domain, set your denominator equal to solve what you get for x. Those are the values you need to exclude. We don't want those because we can't ever have our denominator equal to 0. 
range. Range we have to be a little clever about, but if we have the horizontal asymptote, we can figure out the range. It'll help us at least. The graph also helps us. Right, our range looks like, oh, everywhere from negative infinity to positive infinity looks like it's covered, except for this break area here. And where is that break area? Well, that break area is exactly what we saw in the horizontal asymptote. So our range is going to be really similar to our domain. So our range is going to be everywhere from negative infinity up until zero. Right? Negative infinity. And then we're looking at height for range. Negative infinity all the way up until zero. But when we start to get to zero, we take a, a, a nosedive left. And then we can start at zero again. But even coming from the opposite direction, as we approach zero, we kind of we go away from it. So we can't include zero in our range. So we leave it out just like we did with the domain. And any horizontal asymptotes you have, whatever you get for your horizontal asymptote, that's the number you're going to be leaving out of your range because your graph doesn't actually occur there. But some other things that could happen is your graph could come up to here and then stop in both directions, in which case you would have an upper bound for your range. There's a bunch of different things that could possibly happen. My suggestion for range is always graph it and visually inspect and see, okay, well, I have all values like except for that one, and then I have all other ones, or, oh, my range obviously stops here, or my range starts here and then goes up. So I would just say visual inspection for range. Vertical asymptotes. So vertical asymptotes is where are all the vertical breaks in the graph. These are really nice because they occur exactly at your excluded values out of your domain. Right? We have a vertical asymptote at precisely here, okay? which is in this case is our x equals 7. So vertical asymptotes always occur at, and I'm trying to look and make sure I'm saying it exactly right. Yeah, they occur at x equals excluded values, which we found by domain. So if you do your domain first, finding your vertical asymptotes will be very easy. So our excluded value or values, depending, was at 7. So our vertical asymptote occurs at x equals 7. Okay, we found everything we needed to know about this guy. Um, so let's do another example. I'm going to erase everything we know for this, but I'm going to lead up kind of our formulas or our processes. Let's see, that was for this guy. We don't want that anymore. We don't want this because we're going to change it. We're going to change this. We're going to change that. And then I'm also going to write in blue for this next one. OK, so that was example one. Example two, we're going to look at x squared minus 4 over x squared plus 3x plus 2. So our next example, I'm going to take this guy away. And we're going to look at, we're going to look at x squared minus 4 over x squared plus 3x plus 2. There it is. Can you guys see it? Yes, you can. Perfect, as I get in the way. All right. I'm going to switch markers to blue. OK. So here is this guy. Well, here's the graph of it. We can see that there is also there's going to be a horizontal asymptote. There's also going to be a vertical asymptote. It looks like we're going to have a y-intercept. It also looks like we will indeed have an x-intercept for this guy as well. So let's dig in and find all of our stuff. X-intercept, set numerator equal to 0. If we set our numerator equal to 0, it looks like, oh, you know what? Maybe we should factor this guy first. So x squared minus 4, x plus 2 x minus 2 all over, this guy also factors into x plus 2, x plus 1. Now, why did we factor it first before we even started in? Because I can make this simpler. Hey, let's cancel those guys out. This guy is actually now, we can look at x minus 2 over x plus 1 to figure out our intercepts as well as our domain and as well as our range. Now, we're not looking at holes today, but if we were, this would come in handy. Okay? 
These guys are still excluded values. However, we're going to look at this for our graphing properties. So x intercepts set numerator equal to zero. So numerator x minus two set it equal to zero, we would get positive two here. And it looks like that is indeed the case. These are going by twos, twos, four, six, eight, ten. So that is in fact our x-intercept. So set numerator equals zero, we got x equals two. Y-intercept plug in x equals zero and see what happens. Well, if I plug in x equals zero for this, we would get zero minus two over zero plus one. That's negative two over one. That's better known as negative two. And that is in fact where we go because these also go by twos. So negative two is the y-intercept. So this is a point two zero. This is a point zero comma negative two. Okay, we found all that. Horizontal asymptotes. All right, we have to look at this guy here, but we could also look at this guy here because it's gonna be the same. So what situation are we in? Well, it looks like our x's are raised to the same power. They're both raised to the first power. So therefore we're in this guy here. So they're both raised to the first power. They both have a leading coefficient of one. So according to this, I just look at my coefficients. So I have a horizontal asymptote at one over one or better known at one. And it looks like, yes, I do. Because again, these go by twos. So it does look about halfway through. So my horizontal asymptote is going to occur at y equals one. So that's what we just found. All right, domain. What do we do for domain? Set denominator equal to zero. So I'm gonna use our new function here after I cancel. Set denominator equal to zero. Okay, x plus one equals zero. So x equals negative one. That's our excluded value. And as we can see, that's also gonna be where our vertical asymptote is gonna be. So our domain, I can include all values except for negative one. So that's how we leave it out in interval notation. Range, I look visually, well, it looks like we're gonna go all the way from negative infinity up until our horizontal asymptote that we found already, and that's what we're gonna to have to leave out. And then it looks like we keep going. So our range is gonna be everything except for the height of one or except for y equals one. So our range is all y values from negative infinity up until one, where we have this kind of height break union with everything from one to infinity because after this break, it goes on forever and we're good. All right, vertical asymptotes is just at x equals excluded value. Well, what did we find for our excluded value for domain? Our excluded value we figured out was negative one. So our vertical asymptote is just gonna be at x equals negative one. Negative one is here, vertical asymptote, boom, we're done. Okay, so that's all the properties that we are concerned about as far as rationals up until this point. So if you guys have any questions, just ask. And again, here's kind of the process to figure all of these out. Range, my biggest suggestion is just do this by visual inspection. It's the easiest way to do it. Um, and then here's for vertical asymptotes. Remember, you guys have graphing calculators, so you can always graph these.